Hello everyone, I'm Leslie Anderson and I'm delighted to be hosting the first of our Ancestry Extra webinars, part of a new initiative for us at Ancestry to support our members and help you continue to make meaningful discoveries through your research. Ancestry Extra is a new webinar series taking place here on our social media channels that gives you access to genealogy experts from across Canada and beyond giving you tips and tricks and insights to help you go further with your family history research. As well as me, you'll be meeting some of our Ancestry Pro genealogists, some friends from the archives world, and members of our Ancestry Canada Advisory Board, who are independent genealogy experts from across Canada. The webinars will be taking place twice a week, every Tuesday and Thursday at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. So put the dates in your diary. For our first webinar, I'll be starting with spring cleaning your family tree, tips and advice for getting the most out of your family tree on Ancestry. Doing a bit of tree focusing is great to do at any time of year, and being at home has given me more time to devote to my research this year. So I wanted to share some of my tips and guidance that might help support you in your own research journeys. I should start by saying that I'm approaching this as if you've already got a tree up on Ancestry. And if you're just starting out, you might want to look at the links in the video description below. Also, please share your questions or comments and I'll try to get back to as many as possible. So I'm just gonna flip to my presentation and we'll get started. So I always like to start with our uh, ancestry stats because it shows that we host the world's largest online collection of family history records. And we have 24 billion of them from 80 countries of origin and in over 30 markets, international markets. We have over 16 million people DNA tested and 100 million family trees, which is huge. And it's such a great resource because 330 million photographs, scanned documents and written stories are attached to their trees. So it is really a gold mine for us to, to look into. I always get asked, there, uh, or there seems to be some confusion around what can you get on Ancestry if you have a membership or what a paid subscription or what if you're just a member. And if you're a member as a registered guest, which requires your email and username, registered guests can look at our website and explore the free databases that we have online, look at our support center and our support articles, watch our videos, Ancestry Academy, and uh, post to Ancestry message boards. But the great thing is you can create your own tree. You can create it or upload it if you've already got one, and you can invite other people to the tree and share and collaborate your information together. So that's all for just signing up with an email and a username. However, you're going to need a paid sub subscription because just a, a registered guest, they can't initiate messages with DNA matches, or non-DNA uh, members, they can with their DNA matches. View a most records, so you're going to see the search results in when you do a search on Ancestry. But unless you have a membership, you're not going to be able to see the historical record or the, tr or the further transcription or whatever. Um, you're also, not going to be able to view other members' trees unless you have been invited to them. So that's very important for you to consider whether or not you want to take out a two-week free trial or uh, purchase a membership. So I thought I'd start with some top tips, I feel, for spring cleaning your family tree. And as I go through the presentation, I'll be giving you uh, some summary tips as I go along. So first of all, we need to go back to our trees and check for tree completeness. And what I mean by that is you need to look at whether you've got the ancestors' full names, dates of birth and marriage and death, and if you don't have the exact date and approximate date, we'll be okay. 
and please include place names. I see many trees where they've got you know, good information, but they've, they've left out the place name. So it really could be anywhere in the world. Uh, when you're using um, your, your names and you've, you've got a pedigree, I always find it easier if I capitalize all of my, descent, or my ancestors, so my pedigree line. And I like that because I can look at a list of names in a family group and see right away which one pops out. At me if I capitalize it. If they've got more than one name, you can capitalize that name as well. So that uh, the easy way to sort of fix your tree up, if you haven't done that, is to go into pedigree view and quickly edit the people in your, in your pedigree. Always use maiden or birth names for females. Um, Ancestry is going to see that they got married, so please enter them in just what the name they were born with and Ancestry automatically searches on all of the names that are attached to that female. So if you don't know the maiden name, what, what you might want to do is put it in the, in the prefix field next to it um, so that the, the, the surname is blank. Um, and I find that, uh, you know, Ancestry will present you with documents with all of the names that it searches. Revisit all your direct line ancestor family groups. So spring is a great time to do that. Uh, you're going to be uh, taking some time now and looking at your grandparents, your great grandparents and so on and going back and just go revisit the whole group and see whether the, see whether the documents make sense, the timeline makes sense and uh, see if you can do any more research on them. So there's two ways to view your, your family tree. One is in the pedigree view, which is the view right now. And on the left-hand side, there's icons that show the sideways one and the other one, which will show the family group. I find the family group a little unwieldy um, because there's a lot of clicking and dragging and scrolling around, but it does show you the parents and the children. Um, of the family, and uh, it can be quite large if you've got a large tree. I'd like to start by just telling you how I find a person in my tree. I go to a find person or do the tree search, and I can type them by name, or I can uh, open it up and look at the index of people, and I can look by alphabetic last name, and I can recognize them and, and basically double click on them in order to bring up their profile. What I can also do is from one of the views um, on, their, on, their, uh, on your family tree, and what we wanna do is get to their person card by hovering over a name and then click on profile in order to bring up their profile. And I'd like to spend just a few minutes talking about you know, the profile to make sure that you're seeing everything that is beneficial to you. So the top part of the profile will show the tree name on the left hand side. So that's good to keep your eye on that because if you've got many trees or you're looking at other people's trees, you can identify which tree you're looking at. Um, the tree or person search button is there. The search uh, tools and edit is there. Uh, this is my great grandmother, uh, Florence Crofts. I've got her birth place, her dates, her place, her death, and uh, there's some icons there. And also it tells me that she's my great grandmother. And I'm going to show you how you can also uh, put in your tree the relationship calculator. And then it's got some, uh, some other tools on the bottom of that. And what I like to do is under the tools menu on the right hand side, there's a number of the, well, there's all these features here and I like to see them. So I recommend that you look at showing your research tools on your profile pages. And then for every profile, you'll have those tools right in front of you. And I always like to, when I'm looking at a profile person, I always look at view in tree so that I can view, view that person you know, in their pedigree as well. But if you come across another person's tree, you won't be able to see those research tools. So you'll have to go back to the tool menu and if it's not showing, then you know you're not in your own tree. 
And uh, in order to view them in their tree, you, you would have to go to the tools drop down. So this uh, Florence Crofts, as I mentioned, the great grandmother and notes and the little icon with the number one is a comments icon and then tree tags. And this is uh, really a way to communicate with, with ourselves and our tree visitors. Um, what, uh, what is available. So the notes, I'd like to just uh, tell you that notes are our research notes. And if you've uploaded your tree from another program, uh, those notes come along with it, but nobody else can see it but you. So you as an editor of your tree and the owner of the tree are the only one that can see it unless you invite someone to help you with your tree as an editor. But the comments are the ones that are public facing. So I've written comments to myself and attached them, any public um, facing research notes, I pop them in there. And I also can leave comments on other people's trees if I want to communicate that maybe I'm researching that ancestor as well, or if there's information that we need to discuss or, or that is unclear. So. Uh, use those two as your research helpers as well. But what we've introduced is tree tags, my tree tags, which is a wonderful resource for us tree owners. And uh, this allows us to create sort of uh, research tags that we can find later, but also on everybody's profile. We can put a tag uh, that is to do with DNA, life experience tags, relationship tags, and research um, status tags. And so all of the tags I've just um, shown you here on this slide, these are standard, uh, but of course it, you can make your own. And so my custom tags that I've used are, um, I've used interesting. So that when I'm doing research on a tree, I can, Sort of flag it that this is an interesting this this person is a very interesting character or there's an interesting story there but you can make up your own tags um, to to help you get back to that particular ancestor so how do you find those tags well you go to the tree search uh, button and then you click on filters and the filter my tree tags if you choose one of the tree tags from your filter up will pop all the ancestors or all the people in your tree that have your, uh, your, that particular tag. So check that you're communicating with tree tags. So the life story, facts, gallery, and hints tabs are just underneath the top part of the profile page. And I love the life story tab because I used to invite people to my tree and they would go, oh, whatever, what do I do? And of course I knew what to do, but now I can say, come to my tree, click on, click on the Florence, take a look at the pedigree and click on Florence and they can read a story. And this story is created on the life story page by all of the documents you found on Ancestry and attach them to your tree. And so it generates this, it can give you a map as you can see, a summary, and as you go down, you can see that it pulls in the other members of the family and events that pertain to, to that person's tree. And what you can do is edit this. So if you don't like it, or if you wanna add your own information so that you have a good summary of that, then you can do that as well, you can edit it. And what I like about Ancestry is that they are, they're giving me context, historical context through picture, pictures and some events that would have impacted or may have impacted our ancestors' lives. So I had no clue that my great-grandmother was really a, uh, living in Chesterfield at the time when suffragettes were starting to get militant. So I, I just like that feature. You can add your own pictures as well. Next is the facts tab. And the facts tab is uh, where we spend most of our, our time and research. And this tab is got three different panels. So the facts timeline is on the left-hand side. And this is where you can see from all of those links, you can see those little links to the source documents. 
and those source documents are everything you've attached through Ancestry. So it's going to show in this, in this panel. And it's a good idea to go and make sure, first of all, I always look at somebody's lifespan and I try and see whether I have got all the censuses in their in their life every 10 years if they took a census you know are where are they what's happening in their lives it can also really help you when you go to other people's trees to confirm that they are um, they've attached the right censuses or the right passenger list etc so really to pay attention to the source tabs and the facts tabs to see whether they make sense and then you have a family tab a family portion a panel and your family panel you can create and um, add family members as well to the family you can see parents here you can see siblings and children but also there's a link to see uh, siblings did i say siblings i think i, I meant spouses and children so check you've attached all of the census would be my spring cleaning tip regarding this so that facts timeline it is expanding to really be helpful to us because it can see in the timeline that you might be missing something. So you're gonna to start to see hints show up on the, that timeline. And so you can see that uh, I've got some hints here. I can see that there's a missing marriage. And then I would need to check out that hint to make sure that I do want to attach it to my three. You can also add your own events and edit the timeline. So things like you, you might want to add another fact, like their address or if they were adopted, and there's a whole list of them that you can add. And you can also edit any of those events. And, sh and you can see that they're checked off to show on the life story. If you don't want them on the life story, this is where you would go and uncheck that information. But I use the description field to add my own notes, to make it clear to me what uh, I need to do or what, what was obvious about that record that uh, can make it interesting for me and anybody else who visits my tree, uh, they can see it right up front. And so um, uh, take a look at your what, what you can put in the fact details. I, I sometimes copy and paste the uh, reference numbers to vital records let's say i found somebody's birth and i want to copy that and put it in to prove in the timeline that i actually found a, a valid record but i haven't attached it to ancestry so the right hand side is the family panel and what you can do is add family members to this panel and so you can, in this case, add a spouse, a son, a daughter, a brother, and a sister. So you can expand the family group sheet here. And you can also now see, it's new, uh, additional parent relationships. So these parent relationships that you've got attached to a person, their lives might, this, in this case, uh, she was adopted. So she has a biological parent and she also has uh, her, 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 her life parents. So um, you can change the focus of that adding additional parents or looking at those additional parents by making them preferred. If you click on that, you can see all of the list of the parents that you might have uh, got attached to that particular profile person. And then you can simply make them preferred if you wanna change the focus and do some research back on that. You can also add other spouses, alternate spouses, add children in this panel as well. And then of course, if you don't want a parent or one of the relationships to appear, um, edit relationships can also allow you just to X them out, just delete them. But don't worry, they are not deleted from the tree, they're just deleted from that relationship to that particular person. And so this is where you can go and uh, really make sure, clean your tree up and make sure the right people are connected to the right parents. So I get asked, uh, what if you need to add a person to your tree but don't connect them? And uh, 
I don't know, I, we came about with a name called Hanging Chads. And for people who are my age or uh, whatever, the, I, I hope you understand what I mean by Hanging Chads from that election. They were just hanging around. And so that's why I call them a Hanging Chad. But really, it's, it's important for us to add people, but don't actually connect them yet uh, to our tree. Maybe we're doing some trial research or whatever. So there's two ways you could do this. One is add the person that you're starting your focus research on to any family, just, just get them in there and then disconnect them through edit relationships from the family, from the parents. Or what you can do is put them where you think they're fitting or they need to go and then use tree tags and choose unconfirmed or create a tag like speculative. Now the gallery is uh, an amazing place uh, to put your own research as well as every single document that you've attached from Ancestry goes in this, in this gallery. And so you can see what you've added and when you go to other people's trees you can see what they've added and uh, it's all in one place and it's a good way to go back and revisit whether you've got any duplicates here um, and you can you can delete them so if you want to add your own records you can add it to the gallery tab first of all you find the person that you want to go to and then click on the gallery tab and then in the uh, bottom uh, in the right hand corner, you'll see add where, where you can add your own photos. You can scan in, maybe you've got family Bibles or pictures or documents, uh, driver's licenses or anything you want to preserve in the cloud and upload it to the gallery. You can upload your Word document and or PDFs and, and upload that story to the gallery as well. I put my research notes that I'm okay with people looking at up in the gallery as well. And I, you can also create a story on the fly and then get that in. So if you wanna keep some, some uh, notes to yourself or whatever, you can do that as well. One of the great things about the gallery is when you go and look at a document or a picture, in this case, I have a picture here of Wind Whistle Farm and that uh, my great, great, great grandparents lived in and I posted it on my gallery and when I came back on the right hand side you can see that other people were interested in this picture and saved it to their tree and so those little heads some of them you'll actually see their little picture if they've attached it in their profile but those little heads if you click on them it'll show the user name and the family tree that they put it in and you can click on that and message them through our anonymous messenger service and you can uh, contact them and say hey I saw that you are interested in the same in a, in a family picture I posted who are you let's talk do you have any other pictures uh, that kind of thing so really use your resources to collaborate with the community uh, that we all want to get in touch with so check who has saved your pictures. So I've been talking about some hints already and Ancestry Hints, I look at it as my very own research assistant. That instantaneously when I put a name and place and dates in a tree, it goes out for me and brings back documents and uh, other people that have that same information in their trees and oh boy, I need to look at it so I can see what I want to attach to my tree. And so in the pedigree view, I'm looking at Robert Platts and I can see there's a few hints that I need to explore. And if I click on the hints um, portion here, I'm taken to the hints page of his profile page. And I can see here that a new collection came up way before I, I even knew it was there. It actually found, Ancestry found, that there could be my Robert Platts in this collection. So I wanna check it out. And I review it, I take a look at it, I always look at the original document and I can see whether or not it's my guy. And sure enough, there he is. And I had no idea that he was buried in Temple Normanton 
Um, he, it does say he lived in Grassmore and I knew that, I know that's my guy. So I actually found something without even looking for it. What ancestry can also hint us on is potential parents. And again, when you're looking at your tree, you might see these uh, popping up now, which is based on the information that you have about their children, but other information that Ancestry has found through other trees and documents. So if you click on review the details, it'll open up this panel and it, it may present you with, again, uh, more documents, uh, family trees, and you can click on those links and investigate it before you decide to say, yes, that's my, my father, that is the father or mother, and, uh, and add them instantaneously to your tree. So check out all the hints. Don't ignore them. Uh, don't think they're all you know, not relevant. Uh, most of them are in my case. I do love my research assistant. So the nice thing about searching from your tree is that it searches all of Ancestry's global records all at once using the information we've plugged into our tree. And that can be, you know, a lot of spouse, children, and everything like that. So it does all of that searching for you in one place. You might want to edit your search so that you are um, wanting to go more exact or more broad on your search but also you might want to remove some of those fields so that you're honing in exactly on what you are interested in finding. And so you can do this. And also one of the things I want you to pay attention to is the collection focus. So you might be searching from your tree and then um, realize, well, there's no, there's not the records I expected to get or the, the research results I, I expected. And it might be because your search collection focus is in another country. So always check the collection filter, which is part of the edit search panel, that you're looking in the right place. I love suggested records. And this is something that appears on the right-hand side of a search document result document that you are looking at. And so even before you've looked at the document, it's going to suggest these records. And um, I, I, if you're anything like me, you want to you wanna just get it all and go and start looking at why are you showing me these documents. And I suggest you right click and open the link in a new tab. So all of these suggested records are open in the tabs as I as I go along, but I still look at the first reason, the first document that was the reason why I, I decided to, I came <laughs> to the to the records. So uh, this is um, created by Ancestry because it's finding out other people have who were interested in the document that I'm looking at they've also saved these other records as well as that these other records are are in other people's trees so it's certainly something for you to check out adding records on ancestry to your tree you can decide if if through a hint whether it is a match whether it isn't or maybe it is and you want to you want to put it in a holding bin and so this is under your hints tab and you can go back to it later if you if you're undecided what you can also do is save the to a person that particular document to a person in your tree you can save it to your computer and you can also save it to your shoebox which is basically a link to the record and the shoebox is on your home page so if, you're, if you haven't looked at your shoebox recently, you might wanna to go to the home page and check that out. The key about adding records and adding tree information through hints um, is this transfer screen and, and really understanding it. So on the left-hand side, you have new information and on the right-hand side is the information that's already on your tree. So focus on the left-hand side, look at what's checked off as being different or new, 
and know that if it's checked off, it's going to go into your right-hand side of your tree. If um, the parents, this one is Johann George Beck, uh, and in your my tree, it's John Nicholas Beck, and it, is it the same person? Um, I'm not sure, or is it the right record? I'm not sure, so you can always add it as a alternate fact. So you've got both records in your tree. So make sure whatever's on the left hand side that you have left or checked off is, is appropriate for your side. And I find myself on the right side actually adding to place names or making it clearer um, if I haven't done so. I can do that on the fly on the right hand side. When you're doing this transfer, especially um, because it can potentially cause duplicates, look at the censuses. The names might not be the same in every year. And so Ancestry thinks it's a new person. So what I do is I write down all of the parents' names and the children's and the family and when they were born or their ages in every year when I'm, when I'm focusing on censuses so that I can see whether it is a new person or a nickname or they, it, you know, it's strange that all of a sudden they've got a, another Elizabeth in the family who's 10 years old or that kind of things. Um, so make sure you're looking at new person or not a new person because of those nicknames and because sometimes the misspellings, Ancestry is assuming that it is a new person. One of the first things I did when I found out the gro.gov.uk um, site had maiden names, I decided to go back to my tree and anybody in my family that was born after 1837 I, in England, uh, I went back and looked at whether or not the registration, what I had in, the, in my tree, was actually correct for all of the children. Obviously, on using resources, I mean, I'm not going to order certificates for them all, so I did the best I could under the circumstances. So I went to the, uh, the site, and I look up all of the births, and I find I copy and paste that information into the corresponding birth on the, on the timeline. And Ancestry also has the records around after um, 1837 to 1919 is what GRO has, but Ancestry has 1916 to 2007, which also shows maiden names. So just by way of an example, this is the GRO, it's the HM Passport Office. You have to put in a year, in a year range, and you have to put a surname in, um, and you have to put a sex in. So I'm looking for my dad, 1919, and up pops his result, and this is exactly his mother's maiden name. I copy and paste that and put that into the timeline. What Ontario has, or what Canada has, are under the birth, marriage, and death category. On the right-hand side, keep your eye on the featured data collections, because we've pulled out some of the collections you should look at. And in this case, we're going to look at Ontario birth, marriage, and death records. And my suggestion for spring is that you go back and put the parents' names in, put the mother and her maiden name in, and put the father's name in, and it will search all of the births, the deaths, the marriages, and give you an opportunity to research all of the results. So that you might find on the original record as well, the more information about your family, the mother's maiden name is there listed. After a certain period of time in all records, they. In, in the birth, marriage, and death records, I mean, they started to add more and more information. And in this case, uh, this is a 1930 record. I found out exactly where she was born, how old she was, her parents' names, birthplace of her father, and the maiden name and birthplace of her mother, which was amazing information to get. Uh, still Ireland, but i am at least got more information to go and search uh, on tombstones and things like that. 
So check the mother's maiden name in BMD indexes and the records. You should also search for member trees. Under the search tab, you go to public member trees and you can put in the names that you're researching and see if anybody else is researching it. And so when you're finding the people in other trees, of course, you're gonna to wanna to check out their sources and confirm that the information is correct before you add that person or that those details to your tree. Um, people, you know, we're all researchers at all different levels, but uh, it can be, I, for me, it's been very successful that, that I go look at other people's trees just to get more hints on who I, I need to add to mine. And so under the tools menu, you can save to tree on their tree. So you can do this. Make sure you've picked the right tree. I have many, many trees on my list and I've got to identify the tree and the person that's in the tree that I want to connect their information to. And if they're not there in the, in the drop down from, or the person in the tree, I can add it to a new person. When you added the person to your tree, they're a hanging chad, they're just there. So you need to go to edit relationships and make sure they're connected to the right parents. Merging duplicates. First of all, we all have them. It's something that uh, maybe you didn't even know you were doing when we've merged data information into our tree. So in order to find duplicates, one way is to go and look at your tree or person search and look at a list of all the people. When you see the list, you're going to see visually a duplicate names, and you can refer to the birth dates that you have in. Maybe you don't have some in for, for somebody. Uh, I would go to the person that is uh, the first on the list that or first that has the most information and choose them. And once you've located them, you choose them and then you go to tools, merge duplicates. And what you can do is uh, assess the duplicate that Ancestry gives you, and you can say, okay, that's, that's the duplicate, I want to do that one, and then keep doing it until you have merged all the duplicates in your tree. Now, one caveat is that before you merge, you have to be very careful um, that, you're, that you're not merging just someone with the same name, born around the same time, but is a completely different person. And so I had done this for the presentation. I had a Bernardi Wittison uh, with 61 sources, and I saw that my uh, direct ancestor, Barnett Bernard Wittison, was born at the same time. Now I can tell he's my direct because he's in capitals. And so I thought, well, wait a minute. There's some information that isn't correct. Let's go take a look at these guys. So you go back to their profile page. This is my, my ancestor. And I can see in the timeline that there's a couple of baptisms there. One is possible, the other is probable. I put those notes in, took a look at it, took a look at his kids, you know, compared it to his will. Okay, I'm good with this. But the Bernardi, it has so many documents. I Now I have tree tags. I made a tree tag called a duplicate ancestor docs. So what I did was, and I totally forgot I did, was I made Bernardi, who, who was Bernard, uh, Bernard in, a, in his own profile. And then I basically dumped all of the wives, all of the documents, all of the kids, that uh, were related to a Bernard um, because I really didn't know they there seemed to be like of course four families naming the kids the same and, and so on so in my case I I like to do this so at least there's a place I can go back to and not have to research all of those documents again I can go back to the duplicate ancestor um, and and that whole repository is there for me
What I also did was I printed off their family group sheet and I find this invaluable as well because I, you know, I'm can't see things on the computer so uh as well and so i like it all in one place so your family group sheets are under your tree name on the left hand side of the panel and then i showed you on the right hand side that all of the information is pulled into a document i print those off and of course you can print off a lot of things on ancestry trees you can <clears throat> excuse me, print out a pedigree view, a family view, the life story and facts. And what I like to do is print out the life story and the pedigree view and show it to people. So that when they, you know, if they're interested and they come over and, and they might not be good online, I, I actually have it in a, in a little um, folder for them. So managing your trees is uh, an administrative thing that we, you know, when we set up a tree, we set it up and then, you know, years later we think maybe I should train, change the tree name. I might want to share my tree. I might want to download it and share it through email. I want to change the privacy settings. So in order to manage trees, you need to find the tree you want to manage and you go to the trees tab and at the bottom of the, the list, there is create and manage trees. And this will show you all of your own trees. And you can see I have a lot and then all of the trees that are shared with me. And uh, you can flip between those two tabs. Then once you've loaded the tree up, under the menu, you have settings. So you go to tree settings and the tree info portion of the tree settings allows, this is where you set the home person in your tree. Excuse me, this is where you can also set the tree name and, um, and, and the description of your tree. So you remember when I showed you that it identified that Florence Crofts was my great grandmother, it, because I've set myself to, to myself in the home page, I now have activated the relationship calculator. So it's something you might wanna go back and check. Also, you can export your tree into a GEDCOM and delete your tree. But if you delete your tree, it is something serious. It cannot be undone. So be very careful that you're, uh, you're okay with deleting it. Privacy uh, settings, we might have started out uh, with our tree being private because perhaps didn't understand that uh, Ancestry automatically masks out any living information in your tree. You can see it, but nobody else can see it. If you're, you can't even search for it. So if you're looking for me or my husband or my kids or anybody else in my tree that's alive, you cannot find me in a search result. If I don't have a death date, um, I am going to be masked out from other people. So you can rest assured that you, we take privacy very seriously and that your information is private, uh, even if you have a public tree. And obviously, if you have a public tree, there are great benefits to that. You benefit yourself and the, and the community as well, and, and it makes it easier for people to connect with you and see whether or not you're a family member. If you're private, I found uh, the feedback is that, you know, they don't know what's in your tree and they don't want to bother you. So uh, you might want to think about that and change, change to public to get those benefits. Of course, you want to invite other people to view your tree, to help you with your tree, collaborate. And if you invite a family member or somebody to come and look at your tree, they can set up, if they're not a member of Ancestry, they don't have to be a paying subscriber, they can set up a free guest account and they can help you by contributing their information, scanning pictures, uploading them. You can determine if, if they can see living people, whoever you invite, but they're gonna to need to have a subscription to see the records that you've attached in Ancestry. They're gonna see the information and the pictures that you scanned and uploaded and the stories and so on. But in order to see those uh, historical records that were on Ancestry, they're gonna need a subscription 
or take out a two week free trial um, or get access through the, the libraries if they, if they have Ancestry Library Edition. So when you share your tree, you go to tree settings and you can invite them by email or username, and then you can decide what role they, they're going to play when they're looking at your tree. So are they a viewer, a contributor, or an editor? And um, you can change those roles if you wish. You can check off whether you want them to see information in your tree, or you can remove them entirely. Ancestry DNA has exploded onto the, onto the family history scene, and it is a fabulous tool to help us with our family history research. I've been doing my own family history for over 50 years. I know I started when I was a baby, uh, but uh, it really has helped me verify the research that I've done. I have found connections to other people in the Ancestry DNA database, who we share DNA from a common ancestor going back approximately 300 years. So your ancestor might not have left a record or you haven't found that record, but they did pass on their DNA. So this is another way to break through brick walls, find living relatives, and of course they might have pictures and personal records that you didn't, you didn't have. And of course, many of us like to travel to visit them as well. You can use the power of your family tree by connecting your DNA to your family tree. So or it's the other way around, connect your family tree to your DNA results. And you do that uh, so, so that you can um, use the power of your tree and figure out the relationships based on the matches that you're getting by looking at each other's trees. If you're taking um, somebody else's DNA and managing that DNA for them, um, you, can, you can also attach that to your tree. Or if you just want to collaborate with that uh, family member who shared their DNA as a collaborator, you can also attach them to your family tree and their DNA to your, their, your family tree to their DNA. So what Ancestry does is if it can identify an ancestor in both of your trees, it will tell you that. It'll say this is what, who we think is your shared ancestor. If we can't identify that, maybe you haven't built out a line or they, don't, they haven't built out a line that, to give you that shared ancestor, we're gonna give you common surnames. And Another helpful hint is that you can look for shared places because the surnames might not match, but the place names are. So you need to investigate that. There's also shared matches that match you and your DNA match. So, you know, that's indicating that it could be perhaps on that side of the family as well. So always look at shared matches with your, with your DNA and then look at, look at their trees. Through lines will hint on the path of your DNA matches to your common ancestors. This is an amazing feature of having your tree connected with your DNA. And before we get to through lines, you, you might find that many matches might not even have a tree or they've just put up a small tree with themselves and their parents and of course, we can't see that information because they're living. So it's something that you um, might have to reach out to them, message them, ask them to collaborate, or you might try building out their tree uh, just to do a, a quick tree and build it out based on what they have. And you can add their info once you confirm it. Through Lines is available on your DNA page, and so your DNA page has this panel. And when you explore them, or in order to get them, you need to build your family tree back as far as you can go, at least three to four generations. Please make sure you include dates and places. Make sure your family tree is either public or private, but searchable. Link your family tree to your DNA test opt to see and be seen by your DNA matches. 
Once you've done all that, it takes a couple of days, but if you have any through lines, you can go and explore them after a couple of days. They should be showing. This is one of my matches, and uh, you can see my, myself and my sister. <coughs> oh, excuse me. And you can see in the solid boxes that I have all these people leading up to my third great-grandfather, William Fox. And uh, my second great-grandfather had a sister, Elizabeth Fox, in the tree, but I didn't have any other information. So what Through Lines has given me is the ability to look at my DNA matches and the amount of DNA we share and follow the path down and evaluate those people. And again, we're gonna get a panel out that will have, okay, this person appeared in, uh, William Rhodes in this case, appeared in an 1891 census. So I can click on that, I can evaluate it. He might, have, uh, might be in other people's trees, he might be obviously in this person's tree, but maybe they didn't really have a tree. And Ancestry's gone out and brought this information for us to evaluate. So check out your three lines. We also have new and improved messaging coming. Uh, I don't have it yet, but many of you do, and we're rolling this out this month. So look for this. This is a, a wonderful new feature. It's similar to a messenger or chat. Uh, what I love is that it's going to show us that the message we sent have, has been received so that they have actually seen it, which is what everybody wants to know when we send a message. It'll show who's online and email addresses. Uh, obviously, you're not communicating through email addresses. You're using our anonymous messaging service to get in touch. Finally, with uh, profiles, we each have a profile and I suggest for in, in the spring, you go back and you take a look at your profile and update it with your research interests. Make it uh, as friendly as possible. This is what people are gonna do to check you out. Uh, they wanna look at uh, your age range. Um, they're gonna see hopefully where you're from. Uh, they're gonna see your username or whatever name you've attached to your profile. And if you put a picture there, Ancestry has done um, a study, and if your picture's there, or really any picture, you'll get a higher increase of responses. It just makes you more approachable. But on people's profile pages, it, it can show their trees that they've got and their research interests, which is something you'd want to check out. And that's it for today. I'd like to end by letting you know that Ancestry provides all kinds of help. These new webinar series uh, is a great place to tune in every Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, we are, you can approach support online or through email. We have Ancestry Academy and YouTube videos for you to explore for your education on all the subjects to do with family history and check out our blogs on our ancestry.ca. So thanks everybody, and I'll try and get to your questions um, below as uh, after the seminar. Thank you.